Yeah. Wow. Uh, first of all, what a, what an awesome book you wrote. That is, it, it is. I've read it maybe five times this week, just getting prepared. And each time I, I'm listening, I'm listening to an audio book. But each time I listen to it, I, there's something else I pick up in it, and it just it blows me away how how this stuff happened. It's, it's incredible. Like, how... so let me ask you one question. I've had people tell me they love the guy that does the audio, and I've had people tell <laughs> no. me they hate the guy that does it. Any and whenever what do you think? whenever it's not the person who wrote the book doing it, I don't like it. Just just off that fact alone. Uh -huh. okay, okay. <laughs> is there is there any chance you're going to do it? But a person who writes a good book, mm -hmm. a person who writes a good book is not necessarily a person who has a good voice uh, that you want to listen to for hours. I don't know if I agree with that. I don't know if I agree with that because I've heard. Okay, I've I've watched. Well, all well, let's, <laughs> let's finish this conversation and then you tell me. Yeah, well, I've I've listened to all your stuff on YouTube and uh, all your interviews and and a couple of lectures and stuff. Okay, and uh, no, you're a fantastic speaker. So. Yeah, is there? Did they? Uh, did they like approach you or something? Or they was the book company like we want to get this person no, to do it? Or? No, I didn't. I didn't ask to do it. I, I, I'm so. I mean, I'm so Sydney Gottlieb out. I sat in this little room where I'm sitting now for like two years with Sydney yeah. Gottlieb right on my head. <laughs> so I'm I'm ready to get rid of him. Yeah, no, fair enough. I understand that. It's a uh, incredible. So how did how did you get into it? I had written a book earlier about uh, the Cold War and. Uh, Secretary of State John Foster Dulles and his brother, the IA director, Alan Dulles from the 1950s. And uh, there was a little story in there that caught my attention. Uh, as I was researching the book, I discovered that um, President Eisenhower had ordered the assassination of the prime minister of the Congo, Patrice Lumumba. And uh, the Americans had sent poison to uh, the Congo to kill him. Uh, so I, that story kind of stuck in my mind. And I began to ask myself, now, wait a minute, when you say the United States sent poison, so that meant an actual person would have to do it. Would that have been just a courier? And where would the poison come from? Then I figured out, no, it was not a courier. It was actually the chief chemist of the CIA who was the poison maker. Mm. Then I got interested in him and I found out, yeah, that's the same guy that made all the poisons to kill Castro and various other figures. Um, and as I began to read about him, this is a completely unknown figure, Sidney Gottlieb, I began to realize very slowly that actually the work that he did to make poisons to kill foreign leaders was not really significant. That could have been done by anyone. He, he was just a pharmacist mm -hmm. compounding uh, chemical uh, poisons, but he did something else that was way bigger than that. And that was MK Ultra. He was the director of this uh, very ambitious and horrific project to discover the secrets of mind control. And the more I got into that, the more I realized, I think I discovered the most powerful unknown American of the 20th century. Yeah, I, I mean, I'd never heard of him before. And I, I'm, I'm- Nobody had. Nobody, yeah, it's so right. And you were saying as well, I think um, I heard you say as well, you're trying to get a photo of him during his time in and that was almost impossible to come across is that is that right not only that so i finally extracted a photo from the cia of what sydney gottlieb looked like and i was very excited to get it i immediately emailed my publisher and told him i've got the cover for the book we have a photo of gottlieb and he was also excited then a couple of hours later he emailed me back and he said you know i've talked about it with people here in the office and we changed our mind actually we don't want to put it on the cover because nobody will recognize him. He doesn't, that picture won't mean anything to anybody. So they decided instead to use a kind of a black silhouette, which is actually more appropriate because oh Sidney Gottlieb lived in total invisibility. My mm. book is actually the biography of a person who was not there. Mm. And that made it a special challenge. Yeah. I mean, it's it's such an incredible story, really, and, and how he got away with it for so long as well. Um, there is... Um, there was something that was weighing on my mind when when I was reading this, is and, and it's been brought to me as well by a few other people. And it's like, were you told to not write this story while you were investigating? Because obviously you'd have to contact the CIA during this. So was there anyone there that's like, hey, don't uh, don't write this stuff down? Or was that not a thing that happened at all? <laughs> no, it didn't happen. And I think there's a particular reason for that. Um, this happened a long time ago in the 1950s. 
Um, and uh, the official CIA view of it now is um, that Sidney Gottlieb went crazy. He went off the rails. In fact, we have a quote from the a subsequent CIA director, William Colby, uh, who told the relatives of one of Gottlieb's victims, uh, some, pe some of our people were out of control then. There was a lack of supervision. And I think that's exactly the excuse they thought they would use back in the 1950s when they told them to do all these crazy things. They're, in the back of their minds, there was always this thought, uh, well, when, if it ever gets discovered, we'll just say that Gottlieb was crazy. Let's not supervise him mm -hmm. because we want him to do the most extreme things. Mm -hmm. And if we don't supervise him, that also gives us the opportunity to say, oh, we had no idea. We didn't know what he was doing. So they intentionally set out not to know what he was doing so that later they could say it was all one guy. This allows not only the CIA to escape institutional responsibility, but it allows the whole U.S. government yeah. to escape responsibility for it. And I'll tell you, there's another little detail. Gottlieb came into the CIA at a time when almost all of the other senior CIA officers were the exact same kind of person. They were all white Protestants who came from rich families, whose fathers were either corporate lawyers or investment bankers. They had gone to the same prep schools, the same colleges. They belonged to the same clubs. They worked for the same firms. It was the aristocratic silver spoon elite. And it was very much of a clubby environment. But Gottlieb was totally different. He came from a Jewish family of immigrants and grew up in the Bronx. I think one of the reasons they chose him is that they might have thought, this, whoever we put in this job is going to have to do some awful things. And we don't want it to be one of us because later on we might have to throw this guy under the bus. So let's pick someone that we don't care about anyway. And that's why they picked a guy who was referred to in the CIA as that club footed Jew. Mm. It's, it's very interesting to you that you mentioned that because surely if they were in the same clubs, which undoubtedly they were, they they would have thought this through and, and planned ahead. And definitely plausible deniability is a a massive part of that so um <laughs> it does make sense and it, yeah mm -hmm. just just picking this guy because they knew eventually they would but he, he ended up being there for it was like 20 years 15 years or something like that that's right uh, so he had several phases in his career he was running this horrific mind control project which unknown numbers of people were killed during the 1950s during that time he supervised projects that were the uh, most extreme and uh, intense experiments on human beings that have ever been conducted by any agency or official of the US government. And we don't even know how many people were experimented to death, but there were quite a number. Uh, then he went on to become the poison maker. And then later on, um, he went on to become the head of the technical services staff, which is the part of the CIA that makes all the tools that uh, spies and secret agents use. Um, so he had a long career at the CIA, but I'll tell you an interesting story. Why he's, he has really been relegated into obscurity, even in the CIA. Um, the little town, uh, where I grew up and where I still have a, uh, a place is a nice little seaside village where one of my neighbors, another guy that comes there for the summer is a former director of the CIA. And I ran into him at the coffee shop one morning. And I see there he was with his shorts on, carrying his cup of coffee. And I went up to him and I said, um, I'm writing a book. That's the biography of a, a former senior officer at the CIA. And he said, no kidding. Who's that? And I said, Sidney Gottlieb. And he looked at me and said, never heard of him. And I think he was telling the truth. <laughs> um, one of the things that I got from the CIA, was, and you asked me at the beginning, did they try to stop me? Um, no. And I think the reason is, that uh, they want to say almost that they would agree with me. Yeah, that was crazy. That was so long ago. Thank goodness we're not like that anymore. That's the attitude. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, that makes sense. Actually, that's that's a pretty good point. How many people do you think were in it like during its its height? Was there very few? Numbers? I think mm -hmm. uh, this was the most uh, secret project of the CIA during this period, um, and. There's a reason why it was called MK Ultra. It was because Alan Dulles, the director of the CIA, thought that this was the Ultra project. If he and he was right to assume that if you could find a way to control people's minds, 
the prize would be nothing less than global mastery. Uh, so it was the top secret uh, and most important project at the CIA. Um, but because it was so important and so secret, and because what they were doing was so bloody and so horrific, it had to be limited to a very small group. So only a very few people understood what MK Ultra really was. And that's what led, of course, to one of the uh, most, uh, one of the few well-known episodes of it, which is that one of the guys in the group at one point had a kind of an attack of conscience and quit. This was a major crisis because the secrets of MK Ultra would not only have destroyed the CIA, but would have devastated the image of the United States. And therefore, the idea that one guy wanted to quit uh, was shocking and unacceptable. And before the guy could say anything or quit, he wound up going out of a 13th floor window and plunging to his death in New York City. Yeah, that was uh, Olsen, wasn't it? Yeah. Frank Olsen. Yeah. So... Was he, would he have been in the club or would he have been an outsider? Like yes. I think uh, Ols the reason that mm. Olsen was considered so dangerous to the project was that he knew all the secrets. In fact, he was one of the people that made the poisons. He watched people die under aerosol poisons that he designed. He was an aerosol specialist. And after a while, he couldn't take this anymore. Uh, so yeah, he, if he had spoken out it would have been a tidal wave in the world. It would have been an earthquake. So uh, going out that 13th floor window resolved the biggest problem that uh, MK Ultra ever faced. Mm. And they, there was, I can't remember the guy's name, but you said that uh, it was, it was Lashbrook that, you know, was there in the room with him when he went out the window. Um, he contacted Gottlieb and then Gottlieb contacted somebody else a secret number and then that person was like the, the cleanup man essentially that came and who, what what was that phone and, you call? Know, how did that happen how do you know about that phone call and who is that guy so, this guy named lashbrook was the number two yeah. under Gottlieb. he might have been the only person other than Gottlieb who understood the entire range of mk ultra um and he was in the room with Frank Olson when Frank Olson went out the window. And he's the one who provided police with the story that it was, it was a suicide, that Gottlieb had run across the room and dove through the window, uh, which later on seemed kind of odd since he could have just opened the window and just slipped yeah. out rather than try this kind of Superman move. Um, but let me just add this postscript. So the paperback version of Poisoner in Chief has just been released. And there's an addition. Uh, in the back, I have an afterword in which I quote some of the letters that I got and the emails that I got from people that knew Gottlieb. Uh, and one of them is an amazing story about Lashbrook. So this guy was a chemist who was the number two man in this profoundly important and uh, extremely uh, horrific MK Ultra project. So a guy wrote me a note saying, I had Mr. Lashbrook as a substitute chemistry teacher in high school. And I looked it up and sure enough, when he left the CIA, he went to work for an aerospace company, then he lost his job and he went back to his hometown in California. And sure enough, he became a substitute chemistry teacher. And the guy told me this story, which I reprint wow. in the afterward to my paperback edition. He said, I still remember the time when one of the wise guys in the class made a giant spitball and threw it at Lashbrook and it missed him, but it splattered over the blackboard and poor Mr. Lashbrook was very disoriented and he didn't know how to handle the class. And I felt so sorry for him. I began to realize wow. this guy had secrets in his head that could yeah. shape the world. Meanwhile, he's quivering in front of some high school punk who's throwing spitballs at him. It's oh, very difficult to reconcile these two images. Wow. Wow. So he did he like, he must've had a change of heart, like at the, at the end there. Do you well, know I why he got- if Lashbrook, if Lashbrook had ever wanted to spill his secrets, mm. he would have. But yeah. if, in fact, when the first news of MK Ultra came out after everybody was gone from the CIA and some reporter found him and asked him questions, he said something which I thought was either very secretive or very revealing. He said, I'm not sure what I should say and shouldn't say. 
<laughs> uh, so he, he kept the secrets. The, the key people who really knew about MK Ultra took their secrets to the grave. And of course, uh, the other piece of the reason why we know so little about the project is that Gottlieb and his boss, who was then the director of the CIA in the mid 70s, destroyed all the records uh, <laughs> in a violation of federal law on their way out of the office. Yeah, I got a, uh, I wrote down the quote for that one actually when they're in the, uh, having the hearing and they had to clean out and destroy files that he felt were superfluous, not useful, relevant, or meaningful to his successes. <laughs> Which How was nice a nice way to say, yeah. <laughs> I don't want to be thrown in jail as yeah. a murderer once this evidence yeah. comes out. Yeah, quote, and nothing to do with illegal, illegal activities. And uh, he didn't want to. He didn't want to contribute to the burdening filing problem. Right. See, too I, much papers. <laughs> yeah, too many papers. I love this. Oh my god! How did that fly? How did, How did anyone at the hearing listen to that and were like, "Oh, okay, that well, makes sense." The most one of the oh most god. interesting things I found in my research was a set of uh, declassified documents that I found from the FBI, our our internal security agency, and uh, at and. Uh, in there, it, uh, the uh, FBI office in Alexandria, Virginia, just outside uh, Washington, where the uh, which has jurisdiction over the town where the CIA has its records depot, uh, notices from a newspaper report that Gottlieb destroyed uh, all the files of MK Ultra. Now, destroying federal property is a felony, so the agent in Alexandria, Virginia, wrote to the FBI director. And said we got to start a case on this and the fbi director said you're right we do and then just a couple of days later he wrote back saying wait a minute now i've had a call from the justice department and they told me this they said the reason you found out that Gottlieb destroyed the records was that he told it to a senate committee in a private hearing but they made a deal before the hearing which was a grant of immunity so anything that God he confessed to during that hearing, he could not be prosecuted for. Therefore, the FBI director had to write to the guy in Virginia and say, you have to drop the case. We can't prosecute it. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. It's, it's oh, a classic wow. yeah. strategy of course. in the United States. You, yeah. you, get, you get immunity, then you testify, and then you confess to everything because everything you say under the grant of immunity, you cannot be prosecuted for. Yeah. So uh, people love that. Was, was he the only one that destroyed the files, though? Like, were they able to go after anyone for, for doing that? Or it was... No. So um, all the time that MK Ultra was underway in the 1950s, one of the senior CIA officers, Richard Helms, was kind of his overseer, not his official boss, but he's the, he was the real boss. He was kind of the rabbi of uh, Sidney Gottlieb and shepherded his projects and protected him. By the 70s, Richard Helms was the director of the CIA. So he knew, or at least had a pretty good idea of what Gottlieb had done. So the two of them left the CIA at the same time and they both agreed we have to destroy the files because both of them could have been implicated. So um, Gottlieb sent a uh, cable to the archivist who runs the record center out in Warrington, Virginia, and told him, I want you to take the seven cases of records and, and destroy them. And the archivist was very reluctant to do this, understanding that this is a federal crime. So Gottlieb actually drove out there and delivered the order directly. And you can find in the archivist's file a little note saying seven cases of files were destroyed over my stated objections. <laughs> so the CIA understood that this was a federal crime, but it's a much lesser crime than, than yeah. murder and all yeah. the other crimes with which they might have been charged. Yeah, because uh, I think at another point in the book, you commented how meticulous he was with keeping all of his uh, notes. When he had the, the brothel going, he would... He would write down everything that was happening apart from you know the wages of the the, 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 the prostitutes there but uh everything else he would he would yeah. detail so to get rid of that information that, that the amount of detail that would have been in there would be just incredible absolutely incredible i'm painfully aware that uncovered a small portion of what mk ultra was and what sydney Gottlieb did um one of my favorite lines in my book poisoner in chief is the line that says at the end Everything in this book is true, but not everything that's true 
is in this book. Yeah. There, there's so much more out there, and I think most of it will never be known. Yeah. Do you think any of those files at all uh, would have been leaked anywhere, or do you think those files are, are completely lost? Well, I'll tell you this. What we do know about MK Ultra comes in part from a trove of files that Gottlieb didn't manage to destroy. It turned out that in another warehouse where they keep financial records, there were the financial records of MK Ultra. Who did they pay? And from there, you can reconstruct quite a bit. Could there be another file, another box somewhere deep inside the CIA? Quite possibly. For example, the case of Frank Olson, the guy that went out the window. So it was described at the time as the suicide of an army scientist. Well, he was not an army scientist. He was a CIA scientist. And since then, a series of investigations, which I talk about in my book, have made clear that the story that it was a suicide is quite a stretch. You really have to twist yourself into knots to be believe that it was a suicide. And also the CIA had a 100% motive to get yeah. rid of this guy yeah. because he was an absolute mortal threat. So couldn't there be a file about what we have to do with Frank Olson somewhere in the CIA? And that would not have been in those seven crates that were destroyed because it was even more sensitive than what was in there. Yeah, there could be. Oh, wow. uh, and so there are, there is the possibility that some more might come out someday. But... Um, I can tell you from the years I spent working on this book, uh, it's very frustrating to knock on a, on a, on a, on a door that's been uh, boarded over and sealed and bricked up. And that's exactly what MK Ultra is. Yeah. It's, and they found, I think you were saying as well, when the cops got there to investigate the jumping out of the window, Lashbrook was just sitting in the bathroom. Didn't even look out the window, didn't even go down and check on him, nothing. And then the, the, it was his sons that investigated the, the case a few years later. And then they figured out that he had the, the wound on his head and all this. Uh, yeah, the body was later exhumed. And we not only did we find that he had a big gash on his forehead, which was not caused by the fall because he didn't fall on that part of his body. But a later, a um, an assassination manual, if you want to call it that, like a seven page memo on how to assassinate people was discovered and it turned out that had been written by Sidney Gottlieb and in that manual it says when you want to assassinate somebody uh, a fall from a, a window a high, on a high floor is ideal and all you should do is hit the guy in the forehead with a heavy object first so putting that all together mm. circumstantial evidence uh, casts a lot of doubt on the suicide story yeah the, what, the second in charge is definitely going to read that manual. So, I mean, it goes. It's, well, it's that ridiculous. manual is that manual and others that uh, Gottlieb wrote about interrogation techniques. How do you make a prisoner uh, uh, submit to the will of an interrogator? How do you break the will of somebody uh, in your custody? Has become the basis for other manuals that have been used. First of all, in uh, Vietnam, later in countries in Latin America. And this is actually the root of the manuals that have been used at uh, American secret prisons in uh, foreign countries, including the, and also the prison at Abu Ghraib and in Guantanamo. So all that has its roots back in, in uh, Gottlieb's imagination. Wow. Wow. That's, and um, what, was, what was the committee called? It was like the health alteration committee or something like that they called it the ultimate yeah, of the was, health yeah, chairman of something that was collectively known as the health observation committee later in his career that was the committee that made that was basically him and his chemists who who made the poisons that were aimed at altering the health of people like Lumumba and Fidel Castro and Joanne Lai what a name what a name health alteration that's that's gold <laughs> that's really well awesome. I liked the other name another name I really liked was the uh the Bordello, the whorehouse in San Francisco, they, they named that project Operation Midnight Climax. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's such a, there's such a yeah. bunch of funny boys over there. Uh, they, it, it definitely sounds like a boys club. Like, the more you read into it, the more you, the more you realize you're like, yeah, these... <laughs> Talking about it being a boys club, you know, later on, I began to realize that... Uh, so Gottlieb set up this 
uh, bordello in San Francisco with the idea that he would try to feed drugs to people that the prostitutes brought in and see how they behaved. But he suddenly started going out to San Francisco a lot himself. And now we find out from a deposition of one of the people that ran that bordello that as soon as he got there, the first thing he wanted to do was sleep with all those girls. So I'm beginning to think, was that whole project of setting up that national security whorehouse, at least in part, uh, kind of an outlet for Gottlieb so that he, yeah. Yeah, he has a nice pretty wife back at home with the kids, but here's his chance to go out and have girls that are working for him and he can go out and do whatever he wants. So if you talk about boys' motivations, mm. it's hard to believe, but could that have been part mm. of it? it it's so, actually very uh, Gottlieb, easy to believe. <laughs> Gottlieb was a uh, great lover of LSD and was in LSD maven in America. He's the person who brought LSD to the United States. He, by his own account, used LSD at least 200 times. And I sometimes wonder when I think of how bizarre and sick and horrific and sadistic and bloody some of his so-called experiments were, how do you come up with extreme ideas like this? Could he have come come up with some of these ideas while he was tripping on acid. It, it's almost too horrific to believe. But uh, since he was such an LSD devotee, it's not out of the question. It's it's so weird to think that as well, because acid has this, it, it's known in the, the community as like the love drug and the, the hippie drug. And so to, to, for someone to come up with all this while taking that kind of drug, it's just, oh, it, it just adds levels to, to how detached this guy was from what was going on um i'm oh, sorry yeah you go the the lsd part of the story it's fascinating because um as i said it was gottlieb who brought lsd into the united states in 1953 he persuaded the cia to buy the entire world supply of lsd he brought it to the united states some of it he used you, in very you know, Oh, sorry, do you know how, how many tons that was? Or how, do you know how much? It wasn't was? in tons, uh, but it, it was in, it was, in fact, it was, would have been less than a kilo. But don't forget, LSD yeah. is so effective in yeah. just micro, micro doses. Um, so uh, some of these, some of the LSD was used in uh, just awful experiments where people were locked into cells for months and fed massive overdoses. But Gottlieb also used it. Um, to test it on ordinary people who were told in advance what it was gonna be. These were volunteers. And some of those volunteers turned out to be the godfathers of the counterculture, like Ken Kesey, the author of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, and Robert Hunter, who wrote all the lyrics for the Grateful Dead songs, um, <laughs> and Allen Ginsberg, the famous yeah. poet. So these people were turned on to LSD by Sidney Gottlieb, although they didn't know it at the time. Then they went home and told all their friends, you got to volunteer for this experiment. It's great. <laughs> so it was through Gottlieb that the American counterculture embraced LSD, which leads, of course, to the irony that the drug that Sidney Gottlieb hoped would give the CIA the power to control the universe actually wound up fueling a generational rebellion that was aimed at destroying everything the CIA stands for. Yeah. I mean, the, the irony is uh, hilarious. And it always works out that way. You find in life is there's always the, the counter to, to what you think is going to happen. Oh, my God. I, it, it's so much of this story is just, it's almost not real. It, it feels like a movie at some points in it. It's just, it's so ridiculous. Do you know kind of what... You, you said you mentioned a point there where the movies of the day were helping drive this mentality, but do you know what kind of started it? Because there was obviously the rumors that the Russians were working on it, or the well, they weren't Russians at the time, but the Soviet Union was working on it to counter it. And they had this one guy come forward who changed his speech, and they thought from there, you know, that was some sort of brainwashing. But it was themselves that came up with the brainwashing idea in the, in the first place. So they'd kind of, do you want to, do you know what, what triggered that in the first place to, to kick off this entire you're, you're, story? You're absolutely right. This is one of the questions I asked myself when I got into writing this book. Later on at the end of the project, uh, Sidney Godley was forced to admit that actually mind control is a myth. You cannot make somebody go out and commit a murder then if he doesn't want to commit murder and then forget all about it. There's a lot of movies about that. There's a lot of books about that, but it's not real. So what made them think that it was real? 
I was asking myself this question, and I think there are two explanations. Um, and you touched on both of them. The first was the cultural background. For how many books and short stories have there been about hypnotism and mind control? You put a pill in someone's drink and suddenly you control the person or you, you have a little watch and you put it in front of them and the next thing you know, they go home and steal everything you want for them. And those are infinitely fascinating. All those movies about the cabinet of Dr. Caligari and Edgar Allan Poe stories and Sherlock Holmes stories. Uh, so they would have, the CIA guys would have imbibed all of this, all these cultural references as they were growing up. And I think in their hubris, they would have thought that anything that a fiction writer could imagine, the CIA could make into reality. So that's that provides the fertile ground. But then I think there is one other piece uh, that drove them over the edge and, and, and made them justify these uh, horrific experiments. Uh, and that was a couple of events that happened in the world, which they misinterpreted. Um, one was, as you refer to the trial of Cardinal Mincenti in Hungary. This guy was arrested by the communist authorities after months of captivity, he was put on trial and he confessed to crimes that he obviously had not committed. Uh, but what attracted the attention of the CIA was the way that he spoke. He spoke in kind of a monotone and he had a glazed look uh, in his eyes. Later on, we learned that he his will had been broken by the same techniques that interrogators have been using since forever. They locked him up in a small room, they beat him up, they had intense interrogations that were all repetitive. But we didn't see it that way. The CIA saw that and they thought, no, somebody else is speaking through Mincenti. Somehow they've seized his mind. And this means the Soviets or the communists have figured out the secret mind control. That wasn't true. But in their own mind, they, they <laughs> to that conclusion. Then shortly thereafter, we had another episode which had to do with uh, the return of American prisoners of war who had been captured in Korea. It turned out that a number of them had written statements denouncing the United States. Some had uh, spoken sympathetically about communism and a number of them even confessed to committing war crimes, including participating in germ warfare, which the US government to this day steadfastly uh, uh, denies. So what could have made them say those things? Well, we, we presume they must have been brainwashed. This was the first time uh, that word ever emerged. So we misinterpreted that also. And uh, that sent us into a panic. Uh, and I'll just finish with this one little story. Uh, I was giving a, a talk at my own university, Brown University, um, about this book. And uh, one of the conclusions that I mentioned was that uh, actually you can't brainwash anyone. It doesn't work. At the end of my speech, one of my very insightful colleagues raised her hand and she said, I want to, I want to challenge one of the things you said. You said that Gottlieb never managed to brainwash anyone, but I think you're wrong. He did manage to brainwash one person. That was himself. He brainwashed himself into believing that brainwashing was real. And I think actually she had a very good point. So, yeah. So it turns out the psychological uh, brainwashing is much more uh, efficient as fuel. And I think that what you said as well, not to not to keep you for too much longer, but uh, you were saying that keeping them in the small confined rooms, the cells, did more damage than and any of the other trials that they tried. It just completely ruined them and, and destroyed the soul, essentially. Of the, and, the, and the worst thing is, uh, for example, in this experiment that you're talking about, this was uh, 10 African-American inmates in a federal prison were locked into a cell and given triple doses of LSD every day for 77 days in presumably an effort to find out if you could destroy a human mind this way. And I guess the answer is yes. Yeah. But I've asked myself, so who were those 10 guys? Mm. We'll never know their names. Did they ever for the rest of their life understand what had happened to them? Uh, did they ever recover? Uh, what stories those must have been? And that's just a tiny example of all the tragic stories that have been lost by the destruction of MK Ultra records. So there's nothing left of those guys, like no records at all about any of those 10. We don't know their names. Yeah. We don't know what happened to them. And that's exactly why Gottlieb wanted to destroy those records. Yeah, jeez, jeez. Um, did you did you have to go right now or could you talk a little bit about uh, Paperclip? 
I can give you another 10 minutes, sure. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, what happened with Operation Paperclip and how, uh, yeah, what went on there, how they brought those people over? This is one of the most extraordinary aspects of uh, MK Ultra. So Sidney Gottlieb, as I mentioned, was Jewish. His parents were immigrants from Central Europe. If they had not immigrated, if they had stayed at home, quite possibly they would have been swept up in a Nazi roundup in the 1930s or 40s. And young Sidney might very well have been taken to a concentration camp and he could have been the victim in one of those horrific so-called experiments. Uh, but that didn't happen. And instead, he wound up working shoulder to shoulder with the very same Nazi scientists who conducted those experiments. Now, how did that happen? It happened this way. Um, Gottlieb was a scientist. So he started out MK Ultra by asking himself a couple of scientific questions. First of all, he decided that if you wanted to figure out how to implant a new mind into somebody's brain, you first had to figure out a way to destroy the mind that was in there. In all those horrific experiments with electroshock and massive combinations of drugs and sensory deprivation and so many other things, were aimed at finding a way to destroy a human mind and a human spirit and a human body. So Gottlieb, with his scientific approach, um, asked himself, "Who? What? What research exists? Who's out there that has already done work on how to destroy human beings?" And he came up with the obvious answer, the doctors in the Nazi concentration camps and their Japanese counterparts. So let's go hire them. And some of these, at least one of those figures who was the chief of biological warfare for the Nazis, uh, Kurt Bloma, was on trial at the doctor's trial in Nuremberg. But the Americans quietly got the message to the Nuremberg judges. Essentially, they told him, we don't wanna hang this guy. We want to hire him. So uh, while I was doing research for this book, I went out and visited what I think may be the first CIA secret prison. It's in a beautiful chalet right outside Frankfurt in Germany. Uh, a young German uh, entrepreneur has bought the house and he was making condos in there when I uh, arrived. And he was very open. He said, he took me down into the basement and he showed me the storerooms and he told me, these were the cells where the CIA doctors and their Nazi partners carried out experiments that were essentially just extensions, just continuations of the experiments that the Nazis had been conducting at concentration camps just down the road only a few years earlier. And he also said to me, the older people who live in this neighborhood all know the story. They now know it. They know what happened here. And they have told me that uh, the bodies of the people who were experimented to death were buried in forests around here in places that are now covered over with apartment blocks and shopping malls. So uh, that was an intense piece of it. And the fact that this Jewish refugee who had studied, he gone to Hebrew school as a kid, was sitting around and working out his work plan with Nazi doctors is one of the most mind boggling parts of this story. Yeah. To and Operation Paperclip, the, the, to which you refer, was exactly the uh, US government's operation to bring former Nazis into the United States. It started with uh, spies. We wanted to bring in Nazi spies who knew about the Soviet Union. Then, uh, it it's went up to a second stage. We began bringing in rocket scientists, same guys who had designed the rockets that landed in London and other places in Europe. We brought them over to work on our rocket program. And then the people working in uh, mind control and bio warfare projects decide, asked, well, if you can bring over Nazi rocket scientists and we can work with Nazi spies, why don't we just take the next step and work with the Nazi doctors from the concentration camps? And that's what MK Ultra did. Did they bring over the Japanese ones as well? Or did they go to Japan? To no, watch? and I think the reason was partly cultural. So we did work with those Japanese torturers, but we worked with them in Asia. Mm -hmm. uh, we had torture centers in the, mainly in the Philippines, also in South Korea. In fact, a number of the people that were killed or were experimented to death were uh, North Korean prisoners of war. 
I think it might have been a cultural problem. I, maybe we would have thought that German scientists could blend in fairly well in the United States, but racial ideas at the, in America were not advanced to a point where we thought it was acceptable to bring Japanese scientists in here to advise Americans. So they did advise us and they were our partners and, and the uh, thousands of slides from uh, human organs that have been ripped out of living bodies uh, were turned over to MK Ultra and to Sidney Gottlieb. But those doctors were not brought to the US. Uh, we work with them in Asia. Yeah, jeez, jeez. There's, there's some of the stuff you described about what the Japanese were doing that was that was kind of hard to read the names they came up with yeah just uh yeah just not it's not a good time in history um do you want to finish uh talking about how actually actually i'll ask you one question before that so when they when they got rid of olsen um when olsen killed himself uh you know quote unquote you know <laughs> uh obviously they were worried he was going to release um intel about it but obviously the program got shut down did anyone else from the program kill themselves or? Um, as far as we know, everybody else that knew the secrets of MK Ultra took them to their grave. Uh, Gottlieb certainly did. And here's another one of the frustrating aspects that I had when writing this book. So Gottlieb had four children who are now uh, adults, of course. Um, and I thought they would be great people to interview because I want to ask them, what was your father like? So I focused on, I started writing emails. I didn't get any emails back. Then I started Facebook postings and all sorts of social media. That didn't work. I wrote uh, certified letters with, I did everything. Um, and I never heard a single thing. So I finally decided I got to go out and doorstop the guy, as we say in journalism. I'm just going to fly out to Wisconsin. I'm going to sit on his doorstep until he comes out and I'm going to grab him. That was the oldest son. But before I got to doing that, I found a person who was very close to the family. And this person told me that right after Gottlieb died, his widow called the four children together and made them promise that they would never speak about their father to anyone outside the family. And to my great frustration, they've kept that promise. So as you can see from the book, I did manage to get around that a little bit and find some people that knew him, but the the kids won't speak, and nobody who was involved in MK Ultra uh, is still alive. So I think um, the CIA ethos, and it's the ethos of all intelligence agencies, that you take these secrets to the grave, wound up successful. Yeah, yeah. It's. Uh, I wonder if we would ever get them to, to come forward eventually. Maybe on maybe on their deathbeds. Maybe we might. Uh get some more info <laughs> um all right do we do you want to finish up uh talking about the trials that begin at the end of got the ebb's life and then uh what happened to him when those trials were going on <laughs> godly retired from the cia uh in uh, 1973 he thought that uh, it was all over and he wouldn't have to go back. He started his new life. He wanted to go out and be a good Samaritan and help poor suffering people around the world. But that didn't work out. Um, somebody finally figured out that he existed. He was required to come back to Washington. He testified in secret uh, before U.S. Senate investigators, but he, he uh, never told anything like the truth. He Apparently, pretended that he had forgotten everything that he had done for the last 25 years. Of and course. the senators didn't know enough to question him and ask him the right questions. Um, so uh, that seemed to get him out of trouble and escaped prosecution for destroying federal records because of this problem I mentioned earlier about the immunity grant. But after news of MK Ultra slowly began to leak out in the 1970s, several of his victims began to realize what had happened to them. And some went to lawyers and began, began cases to try to prosecute Gottlieb. Now he managed to uh, push those off for years and years and more years, um, actually even decades, more than 20 years, he pushed those off. Inclu and one of the cases was the case of Frank Olson, the guy that went out the window, his family wanted to prosecute Gottlieb for being involved in what they said was a murder. 
Um, there was another case going on of a guy that Gottlieb had apparently poisoned uh, in a bar in Paris whose life was completely destroyed. Um, finally, in 1999, essentially a quarter of a century after Gottlieb had uh, resigned from the CIA, this later case that I just mentioned about the guy that was poisoned in Paris uh, was about to come to trial at the very beginning of 1999, after it had been put off for 20 years by legal maneuvering. Gottlieb was a defendant. He was going to have to testify under oath, not only about this case, but about the entire MK Ultra project. This would have been shattering. And just as the case was about to go to trial, Gottlieb died. Now, uh, the lawyer who had pursued this case for more than 20 years uh, told me that uh, he's still alive in quite advanced age, and he's got a garage full of records that nobody until me ever wanted to look at. He said, after Gottlieb died, about a week later, uh, I, had a, we, I met with Frank Olson's son, the son of the guy that went out the window. And he said, we toasted to the death of a person we considered a monster. And I said to him, I think Gottlieb killed himself. And he said, oh, yeah, I think he did too. So we don't have evidence of this. But when you think about it, I'll tell you that what the lawyer said to me is, Gottlieb realized that he was going to be the instrument by which all of this would come out and would do incalculable damage, not only to the CIA, but to the United States. And he was ready to fall on his sword at a relatively advanced age. And certainly there was nobody, maybe in the whole world, who knew how to poison himself in a way that there wouldn't be any uh, trace left, and the body was quickly cremated, cause of death never mentioned. So we don't know if he committed suicide. Um, it's just the last mystery of so many mysteries surrounding Sidney Gottlieb and MK Ultra. Those are the mysteries I try to open up in my book, and uh, I think I've opened up as many as can be opened uh, with uh, the material yeah. we have now. Yeah, it's a fantastic book, and uh, I mean... I mean, it's so obvious. I mean, at least to me, but what do I know? But it's so obvious that he obviously opted himself. I mean, to do that. Uh... Well, I, my style of writing is not to hit the reader over the head with my conclusions. <laughs> I just present the facts, and I like the reader to be able to be involved in the story and, and, and make their own choices, and I, I, I see that you have, and I, I'm not, I'm not going to contradict you. <laughs> I think when there's that much evidence, it kind of weighs to one side. Yeah, <laughs> it stands to reason that's exactly well, what happened. the evidence is all circumstantial, but it's very powerful. Yeah, with these kind of situations, that's uh, that's all you're ever going to get, circumstantial. Exactly. So, yeah. Well, thank you very much for coming on and talking about it. Your book again, if you want to mention it to everyone to go read. So my book uh, is Poisoner-in-Chief, Sidney Gottlieb and the CIA Search for Mind Control. <laughs> you got another one as well that I'm reading at the moment, which is the Dallas Brothers, uh, which uh, that's even more crazy. That's even more crazy. That stuff happened as well. And um, actually, just before you go, you mentioned that they're on an airplane with Gottlieb and Gottlieb had a clear liquid that he was drinking. <laughs> and uh, and was it the head of the CIA, Dallas, that mentioned it? or? Then, this is a funny story that I discovered in some obscure place. Actually, I heard that Gottlieb himself liked to tell this story. So at the CIA, there were people who understood that Gottlieb was the LSD maven. Uh, and uh, in fact, I even found a, a, a memo being sent out at uh, Christmas 1953 to CIA officers at the CIA headquarters, warning them not to drink the punch at the Christmas party because they were afraid Gottlieb was going to put LSD in it. So... There, some people knew inside the CIA, but of course it was a big secret. Nobody else outside the group knew. So Gottlieb used to like to tell this story that uh, he was on an airplane and he'd gone up, gone up to the front to get a drink. And as he was walking back to his seat, he was shocked when some passenger whispered to him as he walked by, is that LSD you're drinking? Since this was a huge secret, he turned around to see who that was. And it turned out to be Alan Dulles, the director of the CIA, one of the very <laughs> few people who would have known the true story and also took the secrets yeah. to his grave. <laughs> incredible, incredible. I can't wait to finish that book. I might have to have you come back on and chat about that one in a couple of months. That was All uh, right. Well, it's good to be with you. Yeah, thank you very much for coming on. Thank okay. you very much. Thank have you. Have a good one.
Catch you later. Bye.